I have with me uh, a lady called Jennifer. Now, Jennifer is from Love Oliver. Hello. Hello. Um, so we've got some mutual friends who said you need to speak to this to this amazing charity, this amazing group of people. So here we are. Um, you are in Scotland. Uh, so I'm very happy because we like the Scottish accent here. Absolutely loads. In fact, we now have a Scottish word of the week courtesy of our mutual, mutual friend, Alan, which is brilliant. So we've been learning a Scottish word a week, which is great. It's a wonderful language. <laughs> um, what is the word of the week? <laughs> oh, what was it the other day? Uh, no, I've forgotten now. Oh, see, this is, I'm terrible at language. This is, why I, <laughs> this is why I failed at school with French. I, I did French for four years and I did not get a good grade. Uh, um, no, it's completely gone. We did one for gutter, the Scottish word for gutter. And that's gone as well. I played it 10 times last that's week. Huh? I can't remember. Anyway. <laughs> so um, just tell us a little bit what's uh, what, what's the, the main purpose of Love Oliver so Love Oliver is a small charity that my husband and I set up in, in memory of our first son Oliver he was uh, diagnosed with cancer when he was just a few days old and uh, he died on Christmas Day 2010 when he was just 24 weeks old um, in response to that um, we just wanted to do something and uh, we we wanted to focus on uh, funding research into childhood cancer because it's so badly needed and we also wanted to support other families going through the same journey and yeah it, it's just grown over the years uh, and it's doing lots of good work um, across Scotland and um, for the practical uh, support but we also fund the research at Newcastle University. Wow uh, so sorry for your loss that's um that's such a hard thing at any point and child loss at any age we lost a child 11 weeks through miscarriage people that i think people just don't know what to do or what to yeah. say so they end up saying something that they know is stupid but but they don't have the vocabulary so what do i say um which is why i tend to stick with i'm so sorry for your loss because it's just it's it's yeah. a true simple statement um so 2010 you've tragically lost your child how, how, i mean you've said that's kind of the start okay we can understand that but what made you think let's set up a charity to research what, what was what was the motivation or sort of the, not the motivation that motivation is clear what's the journey into that um i think we just like, it was actually at his funeral that the, a collection was taken for like whatever we were we decided to do with it um and just very quickly we noticed a uh, like love was on the letters in his name so um, and I sort of doodled a, a logo, um, this logo. Oh, cool. um, and so it's love for all of our love from all of our. Um, and then, yeah, people just wanted to to do something as well. And we some people signed up for like the Edinburgh Half Marathon and sort of started baking to do bake sales and all these kind of things. And it just really took off and it's just grown over the years. Um, yeah, and we just, we knew like, we know ourselves from our own experience and through seeing others just how badly uh, research is needed to find gentler treatments and, and cures uh, and earlier diagnosis as well. Um, and we just knew how difficult the journey is, um, how how dark a, a place it is to be. And we well, we just see Love Oliver as a, a way of bringing light to to the darkness for, for other families um, through like we, we provide financial support, we provide meals for parents during hospital stays. A thermometers um, for each family, um, and just and lots lots of other sort of small smaller things. We now we run a, a drop in centre as well uh, at the Edinburgh Hospital, and um, just doing doing anything we can just to to make the journey a, a little bit easier. Um, just because we couldn't we couldn't just go back to to whatever normal life was. Um, like it just all over changed everything, and yeah, his legacy just continues to grow. <laughs> no, I love that. Uh, just. Uh... That you, you lose something precious, but something can be birthed as well. And that's the bit I can recognize because the one thing we learned for losing our daughter was, okay, we've got to live for today because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And that's, you know, that's nearly, nearly 15 years ago. And yet we've still held to that because it's, it's, it defines you and it shapes, it shapes what you can do. Okay. And that's clearly what's happened for you as well. Um, so tell us a bit about the book. Cause I've, I'm, I'm halfway through that. I have to read it very slowly. I'm always emotional anyway. I'm, I'm you know, I can cry, drop off a hat. Uh, so I'm reading it slowly, but to tell us about the book just a little bit. Yeah, I think the book is more sort of our, our personal uh, story. So, so the story behind the charity. 
which is very mo- very much motivated by our um, faith. Um, and we do really believe that um, we, d- we don't understand the reasons for what's happened, but we, we do believe that um, it has been for a reason and, and a good reason at that. Um, and we just wanted to, to share that with others um, because I think um, childhood cancer, as I was saying, is a really dark place. And you can see why it would turn people away from, from faith, away from God, um, why it would um, give them more reason not to believe. But um, our story is very much um, one of, well, um, it wouldn't be what it is if we didn't have that faith. Um, and when when Oliver was in hospital, we, we kept a, a blog and on Facebook and he had over 2,000 followers, which was a lot at that time. <laughs> And um, uh, yeah, it was, it, well, we, we would write posts in his voice and in and, and our own. Um, so people really felt they got to know him as well. And they were like, oh, you should you should really publish this um, as a book. And we were like, oh, well, you know, when he gets better, we'll think about it. And obviously he didn't get better, but we thought, you know what, this is still worth sharing. Um, and so we, we wrote a bit more about uh, obviously the experience of losing him and um, so the, the first, the early, early stages of the charity. And um, Christian Focus had published that actually <laughs> fast tracked in time for an event in 2011, um, and yeah, and it just talks about uh, that that belief that there is a reason. It talks about we how we didn't get the big miracle that we longed for and prayed for, but how um, there are so many many miracles uh, along the way, and that's um, continuing even now, like the books back in 2011. But over the years. There's been so many more examples of just little things like the timing of things and the and just the different opportunities and the people um, who have come into our story and how it's not it, it can't be coincidence and how it is um, all sort of part of a bigger plan that we don't understand but that we do trust in. You can find yourself thinking oh, it's a coincidence and then you get too many coincidences yes. at which point you have <laughs> to think well either this is the most random piece of luck. Or there's actually a purpose, um, yeah. and yeah, you kind of. I, I, I've done this even. I mean, I've been you know saying I'm a Christian since I was seven, and yet there, there are times in my life where I think that this has got to be a coincidence, right? But then there's too many, and you have to start to think this can't be a coincidence anymore. This yeah. has to be part of a divine purpose because that actually makes more sense than just random chance. Absolutely, uh, and that's just very much what our our story is. Uh, is and and continues to be um through Oliver's life and and his legacy um how I and mean, how would you I, I said this was one of the difficult things that we've encountered just a little bit H- how do you how could you help people to know how best to talk to somebody who's whose child is you know very very ill or tragically has died how you know what would you say as somebody who's been through that journey well this is what you could say this is what perhaps you shouldn't say here's what you could do um how, how could you help people so th- there's different responses there's people who sort of don't know what to say so don't say anything there's people who want to say something but often say the wrong thing and and i think um over the years we sort of learned that it's it's not that they're meaning thing um and to sort of be less sensitive to that um which can be hard sometimes um but i think just sort of remembering that um they are still your child um don't be talking about them in past tense. Like obviously there are some things that are talked about in past tense, but like he he is still our, our son. He is, is still loved. He is still special. It's not was. <laughs> mm. um, and that he is still very, very important to us and part of our everyday life, even though he's not here. And I think just like continuing to to say their name and to include them. I don't like even at their birthday, like do something to mark that, like donate to a charity or or I don't know, just something. And and I know I've um, got a, f- a few friends who, who just remember, um, actually there's one, one I'm thinking of in particular who just remembers every date, the date, his birthday, the date he was diagnosed, the date we were told um, that there was nothing more that could be done, obviously the, the day he died, um, and just just sending a wee message, just saying like you're remembering. And, and on other days as well, just... Um, it's just so important to know that they're remembered uh, and not just by you, but by, by other people as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, just, just keep saying their name and um, yeah, not, don't talk about in past tense. 
Uh, the the obvious question that I need to ask is, how could you help people? I mean, L- Love Oliver Clear is, is is a charity that's that's trying to help people in different ways, from the drop in, from you know, financial support to a thermometer, a simple device. Yeah. How would you uh, try and encourage somebody who is facing what you described as the dark time? How would you encourage them? What what could you say to them to to keep putting one foot in front of the other, which can sometimes feel more than you can manage? How, how, what would you say to those people? I think it's just like it's just to try and stay positive, try and stay hopeful, try and just take take an hour or even a minute at a time. It's not about taking a day at a time. It's it's less than that. Um, just um, try not to think too far ahead and just try and stay positive because you don't know how um, it's it's going to turn out. I mean, we we knew uh, medically that there was not really much chance of of um all of it getting better but we also knew that like god could do a miracle if he if he chose to and um you just you just don't know when when these kind of miracles can happen and you just don't know um when when medicine might just work for for someone when it's not worked for someone else and you just have to be positive and ha- have to hope that you will be the the one um that it will be it will be different for and um yeah, just just keep hopeful. Um because you, you have to. <laughs> I don't know. Um but very hard if you if you've decided that it's it's not gonna work out to, to just get through each day. So minute at a time. <laughs> minute at a time is good advice, I would say. Um <laughs> let's just move on to the research. You said it uh was it Newcastle University, you said? Yes, Newcastle University is a key um centre for childhood cancer research um within Europe and um yeah, we just when when we were trying to decide where would be best to fund research, we um, spoke to Oliver's consultant, um, who's actually one of our trustees, um, and we just identified Newcastle as a, a good place, and we've really built up a relationship with them over the years. We were actually just down visiting a couple of weeks ago, just seeing the progress that they're making. So yeah, it's um, good. You talked also about um, gentler treatments. Just just draw that out for me, because as somebody who doesn't get medicine at all, um, I've never thought of treatments as gentle or not. So what <laughs> what, does, what does that mean? I think so. The cancer it's just it's horrific. It's uh, there's the the sort of short well the the short term effects like the hair loss and the sickness and um, so the the pain. Um, but then there's the long term consequences like. Um, the sort of infertility, there's um, loss of limbs, loss of organs that Oliver might have had to lose his arm to save his life. Um, we know a, a, a girl who's had to lose her leg to save her life. Um, we know um, another little girl who's had to have both of her eyes removed to save her life. Wow. And it's just it's just so wrong. Uh, and we just need to do better for children because these, lo- these lifelong consequences are just not fair. Um, but also in the short term for... Um, for the children themselves, but also the, the parents having to watch their child go through such um, horrific treatment, um, which just makes them so, so ill to, to hopefully get them better. It's just, it's brutal. And um, yeah, if if we can do better, we need to, um, and hopefully we will. So the research they're doing at Newcastle, is that into prevention or treatment or sort of wider than that? Yeah, a bit of a mixture, really. Um, I don't pretend to be really understand it all. Because I've never been scientific. Uh, I can, if anyone is interested, we've got plenty of information we can send, which will make more sense to them. But um, it's about um, sort of try. Well, what I understood from it a couple of weeks ago was <laughs> just trying to um, sort of target treatment better uh, and to um, so when they, when they analyse the the samples that have been sent, they can sort of almost personalise the treatment and and predict how it's going to um, work. Um, and so, just to yeah, so hopefully there'll be fewer um, sort of the, of the harsh effects um, and hopefully longer term uh, success. Fantastic. Um, uh, the other thing I think I spotted was there a you talked about is it a charity shop or did I see that or read that or not? <laughs> okay, I got that right. Yeah. No, we had. Um, we built up quite a good uh, relationship with um, uh, the local um, shopping centre in Glenrothes when we were their um, charity of the year. And we were doing a couple of sort of pop-up toy sales every year and um, they were always hugely popular and successful. And then um, in May 2021, so sort of during COVID, which is not when not the, the best time normally to open a shop, 
that was when when we opened when we opened a shop um and it's a it's in the old pound stretcher so it's a huge unit um and it's purely for babies and children so it's um toys clothes books games um equipment all all things for for little ones um so it's great because it's um it's providing a service for local community for young families it's um raising awareness and money for the charity and it's an eco-friendly way to be shopping for your children um so it ticks all the boxes and we've got an incredible team um working so hard um there's, there's so much involved behind the scenes in a charity shop which I didn't appreciate until we opened our own hmm. um but like all the clothes get steamed all the jigsaws get their pieces checked all the batteries um get checked and replaced and toys get cleaned and there's, there's so much um but we've got an amazing dedicated team and yeah we're now we started we were just open four days a week but we're open five days a week now um and yeah, and it's for the first time the charity's got a regular guaranteed income, which is amazing because um, it allows us to be able to sort of commit to to things. Um, we've been able to to do the, the drop-in centre as on the back of opening the shop and also been able to commit to, to other research projects, which we might not have had as much confidence before when, when we didn't have that regular stream of income. Uh, talk to us a bit about the drop-in centre. You've mentioned that a few times. So this, <laughs> this is a, what, Edinburgh Hospital? Yeah, so it's a um, it's literally a five minute walk across the road from the Edinburgh Hospital, uh, the new Edinburgh Children's Hospital. It's a purpose built uh, centre for childhood cancer uh, families. It came about through another charity, um, but we have we've now we've got the lease to run it ourselves, which is it's just an amazing opportunity. Uh, and so there's there's a cafe, so families can come or parents or families uh, can come for for a, a snack for a meal. Uh, for a chat, uh, get some support. There's also a laundry if they're um, in in hospital and needing needing to get their washing done if they're in sort of longer term. There's um, like a playroom, a games room. There's um, like a we've got a wee one of the wee offices we've made into an office for parents who still need to work when their child's in hospital because you'd go into the hospital to to see people and the the parents are like sitting on the end of the bed um, with all these beeps and noises and really rubbish wi-fi whereas at the drop-in center it's it's actually really good wi-fi so and it's just a quiet space for them to work there's a garden room there's a garden we run events uh, alongside um one of the young lives versus cancer social workers and one of the the teenage cancer trust um team they we do monthly teen nights we're we're going to start pre-teen nights next week where we do book bug it's on today and it's just like uh, like book bugs just such a sort of simple basic thing that like most babies and, and children will go to, but when your child has cancer, you, you can't be going out and risking them getting an infections infections and stuff. So, um, but it's just giving these families something normal to to enjoy. And that's just so lovely. Uh, we did the first one last month and the, the next one's this afternoon. Um, and yeah, just just trying to build up the, the sort of activities and services that we're running there and, yeah, it's just an incredible opportunity. It's an amazing building and we're just really privileged to have been given the opportunity to to run it. And yeah, so we just want to build up, do as much as we can. <laughs> it's one of those hidden issues though, isn't it? Your your child, your your wife is in hospital and and you're there, but there, you know, a hard chair only goes so long and life doesn't stop, right? If you've got other kids or you're running a business, you can't just, okay, I'll just everything. Because I, I mean, I guess in a sense, you need to keep on living because it, it's a sense of normality. In I can't comprehend the the level of of you know difficulty and, and sort of this. It's almost like an insane, it's an insane thing to try and take it on board that that somebody's ill, whether it's a child or an adult, and you've still got to carry on with your life, right? So um, yeah, and I I think like with I know um, so in Scotland, the three main sort of centres for child cancer treatment are Edinburgh, Glasgow and Aberdeen. So no matter where you live in Scotland, you're going to have to spend a long time in one of these hospitals. And often that's going to be far away from your, your family and your friends and your support networks. And so there is um, like at least one parent in, usually ends up having to give up their job, but then they're still paying the bills at home. There's often other children at home. There's a lot more travelling involved. Um, one of the main things we do, and which I think I'm most passionate about, is providing meals for parents during their hospital stays because... Wow. As you see, it's just it's you're thrown into this situation, and when your child's ill, you're not thinking about your own needs, and you're in hospital. You 
there's not really that many options for um, getting yourself a healthy meal. Um, trying to find out where to go for it, you often live end up living off takeaways. Or I, I know I ate a lot of chocolate in the hospital. Um, although we were really fortunate that my brother's church just down the road and um, family and friends provided all our meals, and that's why we we want to do that for others. And we so we provide cook meals for the parents, and that's I just think it's the most practical way you can support a family during this kind of experience uh, to provide to provide food <laughs> well if you if you're you know tired exhausted strained um just because you've not got your own bed and then you throw on top of that hospitals which are often very dry and very tiring in themselves and on top of that you're trying to be compassionate and and, and kind and gentle towards somebody you care about yeah food y- you need to be healthy because then you can't do any yep, of those yep, things exactly. and that's where food comes in that's yeah. brilliant. Um, I think often when we see anything that's difficult or a tragic situation, we think, you know, what what can I personally do? Well, it's it's too big a problem. There's nothing I can do. Yeah. However, there's always something we can do. And you're proving that through the work you're doing <laughs> with Oliver, aren't you? Yeah, as I say, like if people are, because I know like when, but if it's a friend or a family member who's going through something really tough um, and it's like, well, what can I do to help? Because it isn't, there's nothing that's going to like, resolve the, the problem of cancer or whatever it is but like as I said like meals it's just so practical just to like hand in a, a couple of meals that will just take that stress away for a couple of days um and yeah just um yeah there is there's there's always there's always something even if it's not gonna uh, change the the main problem I've spent um one night uh, two days in hospital for a heart issue a little while back and most of the time I was lying there being cared for because you've got nurses and doctors. And most of my thoughts were stressing about, is my wife got food? Is she okay? Are the boys okay? Have they got what they need? Have I have I left the house in a good enough condition, you know, that they've got milk and they've got tea bags and, you know. <laughs> and so my heart and passion always when I see somebody ill, it's not I don't care about the person who's ill. I always kind of go one person move thinking, how can I support that person? Because yeah. that person is now carrying everything. And it's, it's, you know, the fact you've got a drop-in centre for people who can work with decent Wi-Fi, it's just such a such a brilliant thing to be able to offer. Does that come out of, I mean, do you get anything from the hospital? Do they help you with that? No, um, it's just, it's obviously, as I say, this other charity own the building. Um, we, we are leasing it. Um, they kind of they pay the, the utilities, which is great. Um, and the... But you know, it's all every, everything that we're doing it is funded by by ourselves. Um, the other thing that we're doing, just when you're talking about practicalities, is the there's a warehouse which um, we're, we're turning into a say shop, but we're not going to be charging families because it's the families who support. Um, but there'll be things like toiletries and food and um, like pajamas and clothes, um, so that the families on the ward can come over and just take what they need. Um, and also like a new game or a new toy or a new book um, for, for children and adults. Um, just because when you're in hospital, well, you're in hospital, it can be unexpected to stay or it can be a long stay. And it's just trying to have things readily available for, for families when it would be things that they've thought about. Yeah, you don't rush out of the house uh thinking okay i've got to have food for the next three days and clothing yeah. <laughs> i take some spare clothes and where do i put the dirty clothes it's it's just it's not it's not in your mindset to think about that because you're just trying to deal with with panic mode i guess yeah. even if it's a planned trip it's yeah. still that stress of getting there on time and can i park and oh i've got no clean clothes so i, I just i love the idea of that dropping center that can relieve for parents such simple needs and it comes back to what i said we can all do something right so it, it, whether it's that simple and you said about your uh, your brother's church were providing meals yeah. you know it doesn't matter if you if if you can't get out of the house often you can still cook a food and give it to somebody to give to somebody there's always something we can do what would you say to people who think well how can i how can i help um with what you're doing um so there's uh, lots of ways <laughs> uh, so we uh, follow us on facebook we've got quite an active facebook page where we try and show as much as possible of what, what we're doing and just how important and valuable that work is um, just sort of liking and sharing our posts on facebook um we're sort of, we're quite new to instagram but um when i remember to to update that um, <laughs> as well. um twitter i'm not so good at um and 
yeah, obviously giving financially is amazing if you're in a position to be able to do so. But I think um, being able to, social media is obviously such a huge thing and um, just being able to prayerfully support us and um, for for sort of the guidance for the next steps and um, and how to use the money that we're raising wisely. Uh, and um, yeah, obviously anyone based in Scotland would, uh, if, you've, if you've got time to give, um, we have a shop <laughs> that has... Um, a lot going on and lots of lots of different jobs that need done. Um, we've also got the hub, the, the drop-in centre in Edinburgh, um, which are always looking for volunteers there as well. Um, yeah, check out our website. There's a www.loveallover.org.uk. There's a wee box where you can sign up to our mailing list um, and you will definitely not be bombarded by mail. It's just a few times, <laughs> maybe not even a few times a year. Um, I do a newsletter when I can. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just, there's always a update on, on the research there as well, um, which is really helpful. Um, so, yeah. so 2010, really tragic year for you. 2011, we started to do something. Did you, in your wildest dreams, have any clue of what you'd be doing? Where are we? 13 years on. Absolutely not. It's just, <laughs> it's <laughs> crazy and incredible. Um, yeah, it's just amazing to just see how it's grown and um like every year um you say, Oh, well will we still be able to like how are we gonna raise that much again? And um but it always happens and we feel more confident about it now, um, because well, especially with the shop and um but it just it's funny because I know um unfortunately and sadly for a lot a lot of charities, COVID um was sort of the I can't think of the word, um, but they they suffered through COVID. Whereas for for Love Oliver, it, it just seems to have thrived since since COVID, um, and I think that it's just sort of following the theme of um, thriving in the face of ad adversity, which which Oliver did. Like he he smiled and thrived his way through horrible treatment, and sort of set set the standard for the rest of us to um, to live up to that. And his charity certainly is doing that. Um, and especially since COVID, it's just totally taken off and um, it's continuing to grow. Um, and it's quite exciting to think what, what's next. Because, um, yeah, we're just we're getting some great opportunities and just trying trying to make the most of them. But, yeah, I was um, my husband and I we were both Andy and I were both teachers um, at the time. And I've now given up uh, teaching to um, work for the charity full time. Um, he's he's still teaching, but um, he he does what he can, um, and evenings and weekends and holidays. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, we we can never have expected something so amazing to to come out of something so so tragic. And I think he Andy often um, will talk about it as like the this like the story of the the loaves and the the fish. It's like the little boy with the small offerings, and it's turned into something um, so much bigger. And it's the same with the, the charity. It's all it's all been very small, small um, like things like sending emails and um, uh, planning planning a bake sale, or and just all these sort of small scale events and offerings been turned into to something uh, bigger and beautiful. And yeah, we just want to want to do what we can with it well it's so obviously meant to be somehow <laughs> mm. uh, so the one question i wanted to come back to was you talked about some of the surprising things of running a charity shop what's what's something that you just thought i didn't know would have to be doing this um <laughs> what's the main thing um i don't know there's there's just oh i can't i can't think of anything any one thing in, in <laughs> like, but there's like our soft there's a We've got a lot of storage space because it's over. The, we've got the main floor, and then upstairs and downstairs are the storage and like the the soft toys. We've got like a box for meerkats and a box for giraffes, and, <laughs> and it's just it's mental. Just and it's the amount of stuff that um, people have to give. Um, it's incredible, um, and yeah, it's just crazy that there's there's so much stuff that um people are, are finished with which is actually still in such good condition and we opened in may 2021 and we've never actually had to say oh we need donations because they just keep flooding in um and it's it's amazing and it's 
we're doing our bit for the environment, which is lovely as well. Um, because so many people they say, Oh, can you take this? Because if not, it's going to landfill. And we're like, Of course, we'll take it. Um, <laughs> there's no way that's going to landfill. Um, but it's quite scary to think that it would otherwise. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Um, I, I love, I love how out of something that you described as a dark time or dark moment, we've got such a celebration of so many things that you're doing to help so many people, and it's it's fantastic. So thank you for for trying, really, because th that first step of should we, could we, has become we are. And yeah, I think on the on the back right. of our, we always have like the charity Christmas card, and on the back it's got the the verse um, John one five. Um, the, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. And I think that's just a, another sort of summary of, of what the charity is about. It's just not not letting the darkness win and uh, just being a light in the darkness um, to, to other families. Um, yeah, and just and sharing our story as well. So. Which is oh, which is amazing. So thank you so much for um, sharing some of your story with us today. I'm really privileged. I love getting to meet so many people in the interviews and learning new things, but I love hearing people's hearts, their stories. And I love how people can say, look, this wasn't great, but but we did something and we're well, we doing this and it's kind of grown and grown and grown. And I, I love being able to share those. I say success stories carefully because it's not quite what I mean, but it's those stories of doing something and it actually making a difference to people's lives. So um, as a parent, thank you for what you're doing for other parents who are being thrust into, I can't even comprehend, the difficulty, the level of complexity of balancing family and home and job and hospital and child. Um, and so I guess, you know, as a parent, thank you for what you're doing for other parents, because I have a tiny understanding of a small portion of the difficulties that parents might go through the hospital situation. So um, so thank you for that. Just give us a website once more where people can find out more about you. And I guess the book's available on the website as well. Yeah, the book and a few other things. We actually we we need to get some new merchandise. It's been a while, but there's a few other things. There's the book and like pin badges and pens and so on. Uh, so it's loveoliver.org.uk um, and our Facebook page is just Love Oliver. Uh, there's also the Love Oliver Shop uh, Facebook page, um, and as I say, you can find us on Instagram as well. But it might not Sometimes. be so much on there. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> yeah. Hey, baby steps, little steps, one step at a time. <laughs> Minute by minute. Um, uh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time. I really appreciate it. And I love hearing oh, Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, if you want to find more, uh, loveoliver.org.uk is a good place to start doing that. Um, Oliver, uh, Oliver, <laughs> Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Pure 24-7 Radio is listener supported, which means we are free, online and always pure because of the generous support of our listeners. If you would like to contribute financially, please visit pure247radio.org. If you'd like to find out how we use your money, please visit the Our Cost section. Any donation of any size will help keep us on air and broadcasting for free. Thank you.